What's the word, y'all? We got some more BR articles. I've done the last week, basically. The last seven days, I reacted to a Bleach Report article. And y'all absolutely loved it. I didn't have any idea that y'all were going to enjoy the article reactions more than the actual footage reactions. But here we are. Now, today, we don't have a top 10 of this position, this or that. But we got the top storylines for every team in Orlando. I'm going to read through and I'm going to tell you what I think should be the top storyline. If I agree if this is the top storyline. And answer some of the questions attached to these storylines, okay? So, it should be fun. Shout out to Dan Favell and, uh, and Bleach Report. If you're new around here, subscribe. This is the way you find out if you're subscribed. Because a lot of y'all probably don't know. You see my, this box where you're watching this video in. This box. Right beneath it, there's a little red button. If it's red, click it. That means you aren't subscribed to the channel just yet. And like 65% of the people watching these videos aren't subscribed. So go ahead. You watching anyway. So you might as well subscribe to the channel. And you watch it anyway. You might as well like the video. All right. Enough of that. Let's get into the top storylines for every team in Orlando. Uh, I can say that my favorite thing about Orlando so far is that we have so many players that are vlogging or going on Instagram or going into live. Like we get to see inside of the bubble. It's like we're kind of there in a way. So shout out to Evan Fournier, Matisse Steibel. Uh, I just saw Troy Brown Jr. just dropped a vlog, JaVale McGee, these are all players that have vlogged in their experience so far, and I'm guessing we're going to have more players too. So, thank you to y'all, because we've been missing NBA content. Okay, first question is for the Boston Celtics, is Jason Tatum ready to spearhead a legit title contender? That, I would say, that is the, the big question, because um, Jason Tatum has blossomed into the best player on the Boston Celtics roster. Is he ready to be the number one guy on a championship team? I don't know. It might be too early, but Jason Tatum is that special where maybe it's not too early and he can actually do it. Um, I saw in the comments of like one of my last videos, one of the top comments was like they could see Jason Tatum having a Dirk like career where like he stays a part of the Boston Celtics and eventually somewhere down the line gets the Celtics back to a championship. And I could see Jason Tatum being that type of guy as well. Um, I don't know if they're ready this season, but I'm not counting them out either. You know what I'm saying? No, no matter who they're matched up in this first round, second round, and conference finals, they legitimately have a chance because they are such a nice team. They're one of the few teams that are, I, I don't want, I think it's top, top 10 in offense and defense that are in the bubble. And they have a way as a team of winning very ugly games. And those are the type of games that the playoffs are really about. You know what I'm saying? Some games, both teams are going to be off. And the Boston Celtics have found a way to win a lot of those games. And Jason Tatum is going to have to be the focal point of that. So not a bad question. Not a bad question. I don't even have the answer to it. We're, we're waiting to see. Next, Brooklyn Nets. Karis LeVert goes alone-ish. Um... I've also seen people asking, like, what's the point of them even being there? And one thing I can say is that Karis LeVert can mess around up his trade value for the B Brooklyn Nets to eventually try to make a splash for a better player. Um, not saying that Karis LeVert is bad or anything. Obviously, he's an above average player. But I think the Brooklyn Nets are trying to get their hands on that third star. And if Karis LeVert goes to Orlando and you can see, like, man, Karis LeVert's got a lot better. Um, then that can help them potentially put together the trade. For, I, I'm just throwing a name out there because his name is always in these conversations, Bradley Beal. I don't know. I, again, I don't think the Wizards are selling Bradley Beal, but if they were to try to sell him and Karis LeVert goes down to the bubble and wins the Brooklyn Nets some games by himself, you're like, okay, if I'm the Washington Wizards, I know I have to trade Bradley Beal. Maybe Karis LeVert is a guy I, I want to replace him with. So Karis LeVert is up in his trade value. They would like to keep Spencer Dinwiddie there, but obviously he's not traveling. He could have helped his trade value. At the end of the day, the Brooklyn Nets are going to be a fan favorite team because they have Jamal Crawford and Michael Beasley. Right now, they may add more players. Who knows? Next, the Dallas Mavericks. How far away are they from contention? That's a very good question because, as y'all know, they had the league's best offenses right here. But, the, again, the playoffs are slowed down. It's, it's a lot different than the regular season game. So you wonder how the league best offense will translate to, like, the playoff basketball. Uh, the Ringer Rob Mahoney wrote – oh, that's a lot. Uh – well coach, stir up the yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they're ready to be contenders just yet. I think that these eight games in the bubble for them though, I think they're at the sixth seed at the moment. I, I wouldn't be surprised they jumped all the way up to like four, maybe even three, because I think they have a favorable schedule. And of course they have basically their entire roster except for Dwight Powell uh traveling with them. So how far away from our contention are they? We'll find out. We'll find out next. We have the Denver Nuggets, Slim Nikola Jokic. Right, so we're trying to figure out if this guy, this this guy right here that has definitely relied on his size a lot, um, him being slimmer, how much does that affect his game? Uh, for the most... Wait, Bleacher Report used this article? Isn't this fan flipping him off? 
and BR decided to use this article. They wild for that one. Uh, yeah, like Nicolio's the guy that used his body a lot to to baby smaller defenders and everything, and now he's thinner. And uh, in most cases, in most cases, a player getting more fit has benefited their game in basketball, um, and probably pretty much every sport because you're just more agile, you're just faster, you're quicker. But a guy like Jokic doesn't need, he didn't need to be faster, quicker, or things like that. So I'm curious. I am also curious about Slim Jokic and how much that will change his overall play. I'm guessing he still will be great. Will it be better? Or will he just be the same? You know. Next we have ceiling without Victor Depot. All right, well, for good thing for them is that they have a good sample size of playing without Victor Oladipo, right? Because Victor Oladipo had just come back and only played 13 or so games or so. So they had already played so many games without him. Obviously, they're also still missing Jeremy Lamb, who had an injury too. Um, what is their ceiling without them? I, I can't, for the life of me, look at this team and say that they are contenders without Victor Oladipo and without Jeremy Lamb. They're going to give some teams some hard times in the playoffs, but I'd be very, very surprised if the, if they get somehow got to the conference finals. I'm like, yeah, you 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 surprise, you surprise me, you surprise me. Yeah, I don't think I don't think their ceiling is that that high without those two players. Next, uh, Houston's fading in micro ball. The the main thing that confuses me about the Houston Rockets is the fact that they just decided not to to have a singular big on the roster. They have Tyson Chandler, but he's basically 40 and he hasn't played other than like garbage time minutes but even if if i was the the general manager if i was daryl Morey of the houston rockets i love the idea of the small ball obviously but i would always have that one player my 10th 11th man on the roster who may not get pt unless the situation calls for it right my seven footer that's just sitting there that's just sitting there like this they don't have that so if they're relying so much on pj tucker if this man pj tucker misses if God forbid something happens to PJ Tucker in this bubble where he misses some games, he gets injured, yada yada. The whole idea of this micro ball is out the window because PJ Tucker is so he's so important to their winning. So if something happens to this six five fire hydrant of a player, the whole micro ball is out the water. And I I know they have like Jeff Green, they just signed Bob Mute. Then they've got somebody else too. None of those guys will even come close to what Clint, I mean, not Clint Capella, but P.J. Tucker can do for this roster. So there's just one injury away from the whole season being scrapped. And I'm not even talking about an injury to one of their elite players. And I don't, also don't know if they run into Jokic in the second round. Who is guarding Jokic? Who is guarding the other bigs if they go against Anthony Davis? Bro, Anthony Davis is probably going to have a 40-point average in the series. I just wish that they would have kept one big on the roster just in case. Their security blanket. But it, they didn't need it. They decided that they didn't need it. Next, we have the Clippers. What's the closing lineup? Yeah, you have so much talent. Um, I would say that my question for them mostly um, is, I mean, we didn't have a lot of time of PG and Kawhi. Basically, the whole roster playing together. The games that we did have their whole roster healthy and playing together, they were superb. But it's still a small sample size. And now we're going to the bubble where these guys don't probably don't have the chemistry of some of the other teams that have played 60-so games together while healthy. So that will be my thing. The closing lineup, I sh I'm sure that they have so many different variations. It's just going to be situational. It's going to be situational. Next. Replacing David Bradley, and this has probably come out before Rondo's injury. Rondo decided, no, he didn't decide, but I'm guessing that he broke his hand, his thumb, or something like that. So he's going to miss a extreme amount of time. So not only are they replacing Avery Bradley, they're going to have to replace um, Rajon Rondo, who's one of the better playoff players in recent history. It sucks. It, it definitely sucks. If I was a Lakers fan, I'd be pretty bummed out about these two players missing time. Um, but now they have J.R. Dion Waiters, Alex Caruso is going to have to play a lot of minutes, and obviously LeBron is going to have to take the the crown of being the playmaker and one of the only playmakers really on the roster. Next, um, Justice Winslow's fit. I forgot Justice Winslow even got traded here, bro. That's how long we have been without basketball. He actually, this, this jersey is just fire. I feel like this jersey would look great on anybody. But what is his fit? I have no idea. I haven't seen that boy Justice play in so long. He played in just 11 games this season. I don't know what he's good at anymore. I don't know what he's bad at anymore. So I'm just going to skip this and hope that he, he works out. I'm, I would say that that trade is a worthy trade, though, for Justice Winslow. Because, I mean, 
when he was playing well a couple years ago, he was looking really good. And the fact that they traded Iggy, a guy who wasn't playing for them anyway, and I think it was Jay Crowder was also in that trade um, who was actually playing really nice for them. But you get a younger guy that fits the timeline a little bit more, and we know that his potential is still pretty high. Next, here same thing, integration of Jay Crowder and, and Andre Iguodala. So that was the bad thing about the whole shutdown of the season is that it happened like right after basically the trade deadline or maybe a month after the trade deadline. So we we didn't really get to see Iggy play. He only played 14 games and not a lot of time alongside some of the other guys. Eric Spolster didn't really have that time to figure out rotations with these new guys. Both of these guys are good enough to be rotational pieces on, on the team that's trying to compete, but they they didn't really have the time to be like, okay, Jay Crowder plays best when he got Jimmy Butler here, or he plays best, maybe Bam Adebayo's in the bench because they need a little bit more space with Iggy on the court. They didn't really have a chance to really toy with all of that because of the suspension of the season, and it's only eight games, and these eight games matter. It's, it's tough. It's tough. Next. Postseason Eric Bledsoe has been very, very disappointing so far, and maybe this is the year. He is like the X factor for me. Um... They can't win a championship if Eric Bledsoe decides to be subpar in multiple series. That's what I'm saying. Next. Uh, Zion, Zion, Zion. We all know. Big surprise. Big surprise. I know. Zion is the X factor for the Pelicans. Um, they were such a good team when they had the lineup of Drew, Lonzo, B.I., D. Faves, and uh, Zion Wilson. That lineup was destroying teams. And now we're probably going to see that lineup full time. So, Yes. Biggest storyline is that Zion Williamson is playing basketball again, and he looks fitter than he ever has before. <sighs> can you play themselves? Can the Thunder play themselves into a different timeline? Okay, I got to read what you mean by that. Um, that the present core lasted long in the surprise. Okay, I understand what they're saying. Uh, I think, I don't know. I just, I'm just happy to see them in the playoffs. At the end of the day, they got my favorite up and coming young player in Shea, and they got my favorite vet in Chris Paul. So I just want to see them play. I don't even care about the timelines, yada yada yada. I just want to see them boys play and give somebody some some hardships because that team is actually really nice. Next team is the Orlando Magic roster to crossroads. Yes, hopefully this is the season if they don't get out of the first round, which we can all bet that they won't because they're going to be a lower seed. They're going to have to go against Toronto, Boston, or Milwaukee Bucks. They can decide to make some changes to their to their team. I saw in um in Evan Fournier's vlog that John Isaac is in a bubble. So we don't even know if John Isaac is playing. I hope he is, because that gives me a reason to watch the Orlando Magic. Um, but we don't know if he's playing. And hopefully this is the season they're like, okay, maybe we'll trade Aaron Gordon. Okay, maybe we'll try to trade Vucevic. And they tr not hit a reset because they have some pieces here, but they try to reorchestrate this roster from just being the six, seven, eight seed every single year. Because there's no fun in that. There's no fun in being mediocre. It, re it really not. Next. Uh, wait, wait, what did I say? Uh, we're planning on life without Jonathan. So he's there, but it doesn't look like he's going to play. Oh, that's tough. That's tough. Next is the 76er. So, like, can this roster work? That is the biggest question. They're the biggest uh, question mark team in the entire thing. Because, obviously, on paper, this team should be amazing. But they haven't figured that out. But they had these moments, these stretches where they look like the best team in basketball. But then they also have these stretches where they, like, you know what I'm saying? So could this team work? That That is, they are the biggest X-Factor team. If this team went on and got eliminated in the first round, I would not be surprised. If this team went on and got to the conference finals, I would not be surprised. That's how big of a difference this team can look from day in and day out. 76ers, man. 76ers fans, y'all have it tough, bro. Y'all have it real tough because you just don't know which version of the 76ers are going to show up. Okay, my boy Mikael getting some love in the article. Mikael Bridges is a rival. Now I see the Phoenix Suns. They're not playing for that much. You know what I'm saying? We don't. I don't think anybody expects them to to really make that jump to the eight seed. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I think people are prioritizing Dame and the Trailblazers or Pelicans and of course the Grizzlies who already have the spot. I don't think people are really thinking that the Suns are gonna make it. But without Kelly Oubre, what they're saying is that Mikael Bridges is probably going to slide into that spot and he's going to have room to grow. And just overall as a team, y'all know they're, they're a very young roster. Uh, overall as a team, they have time to grow inside this bubble, get some playoff, ex not playoff experience, but see what the playoff atmosphere could kind of be like without fans. Next. Uh, the return of Zach Collins and Yusuf Nurkic. Yeah, man, that's one thing that... Terry Stotts has not had a chance to figure out his lineups and stuff because of the suspension of the season. Yusuf Nurkic is back, and uh, and Zach Hollis is back. And with no Trevor Reza, that means we're probably going to get some mellow at the three. 
again, like it was old times and Zach Collins and Yusuf Nurkic. I don't know how they figure out their big man rotation because they have so many of them now with Hassan Whiteside also being there. Uh, but it's something that we're going to have to wait and see. The Marvin Bagley third place in the pecking order. I, somebody said in my comment section, I always skim over the, the Kings. And that's not by design. It's not like I dislike the Kings or anything. They're just a very confusing team overall because Marvin Bagley is confusing to me. And their coach, Luke Walton, is confusing to me. So, yeah, I would love to see where Marvin Bagley places on the pecking order. I would guess he's probably number three, maybe even number two on some nights. Then we have the end of the postseason streak. I would guess so. Uh, we have no LaMarcus Aldrich. But if anybody could do it, it's Greg Popovich, bro. If anybody could do it, it's Greg Popovich. And Lonnie Walker cut off his hair. I'm expecting big things from Lonnie Walker. Maybe not this bubble, but just like in the general of the course of his career. Next, the state of the half-court offense. Um, oh, they about to get into some advanced stats. They rank 18th in points score per half-court possession. Below the board, okay. Bench trans transition attack. So, yes, they're great when running, but obviously... The game slows down the playoffs, so how can they do that without having a go-to guy like Kawhi Leonard like last year? Of course, they have Pascal Siakam, who they're, who they're relying on, but we just haven't seen Pascal do that just yet, and maybe this is the time he does because there was times in the playoffs last year where the Raptors were bleeding, and they needed Kawhi to stop it, and Kawhi hit the shot to stop it, and, they, and I don't know if they have that in the, the half court right now. So that is, yes, the a biggest story last, last question mark for them. Look at Cal Lowry, bro. Uh, then we have the Utah Jazz, the Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell dynamic. We've talked about it plenty of times here on this channel before, but yes, we got to figure out how they're going to fare together. And then lastly, who emerges without Bill, Bartons, and Wall? Hopefully, is Isaac Bonga. Hopefully, it is Troy Brown Jr. And I love watching Rui Hachimura. It's going to have to be one of those guys. Uh, overall, cool article, cool questions, and cool storylines. If you enjoyed it, leave a like. If you're new, subscribe. I'm out.